All right, good morning, church. Let me say, first of all, it is so good to be back. I missed you last week, and uh, sorry, sorry I couldn't be here. I, actually, I'm going to be honest, so I wanted to be here, and uh, my doctor told me that I wasn't allowed. So Dr. Burkholder looked at me and said, you are not going to church. Actually, that's not true. She looked at me, and she said, here's the deal. You can go to church, but you have to arrive at 10 o'clock, you have to sit in the back row and not talk to anybody, and then we're leaving as soon as the service is over. And I said, I can't do that. I just absolutely can't do that. And she said, well, then you're staying home. And so I stayed home. But on a serious note, I do, I really appreciate all of your prayers and uh, the love. Man, I felt them this week. I felt the prayers. I felt the love. Thank you for the cards, the text messages, everything. Um, um, Thank you so much. I feel good and um, strong. I'm getting there, and I'm, I'm back at it. So thank you so much for your prayers. One of, a, one of our teams said today, and said, man, Brian, it's so good to be, for you to be here. We can't do it without you. And I looked at him, and I said, that's absolutely not true because I wasn't here last week, and Brad wasn't here last week, and I hear that Jonas and the praise team and Jose absolutely kicked it out of the park. And... Um, Jose's message was absolutely fantastic, and uh, I appreciate that. And so none of us are indispensable. This is God's church, and we're going to see that today. So would you begin the service, or begin this segment of the service with prayer with me today? Let's pray together. Father, thank you that there was a time in my life when I saw the light. Lord, when I was in darkness, I was in my sin. And thank you that you didn't give up on me, but you sent Jesus who died on the cross for me and paid the price for my sins and redeemed me. And thank you that I was able to see the light. And Lord, I know many of the folks here today have that same testimony. Thank you that we are who we are, not because of us. We are who we are because of Jesus. And today we give him all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. And Lord, today as we look at this passage of Scripture that Carla read just a few moments ago, help us to see the truth. Help us to realize that we have a task, a job, a mission, the greatest mission on earth you've given to us. Lord, Lord not, just, not just Hollywood Community Church, not just the organization of our church, but you've given it to each and every one of us. Help us to take ownership of that mission. Help us to be the witnesses that you desire for us to be. And we promise to give you all the praise and honor and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many of you know that I'm a, I'm a college football fan. I love anything to do with college football. And I was reading again this week uh, a story from a hundred years ago in college football, a story that has to do with Notre Dame. Any Notre Dame fans here? I'm not sure whether we have any Notre Dame fans here. A hundred years ago, Newt Rockney was the coach of Notre Dame. And Notre Dame was a football powerhouse. I'm talking about in the 1920s, before I'm sure most of us, if any of us, were born. In the season 1920, their star player was a uh, young man by the name of George Gipp. George Gipp turned out to be an All-American, and, and he was their star player. But sadly, during his senior season in 1920, George Gipp came down with an illness. He, he contacted streptococcal pneumonia. Now, now, in this day and age, we take some medicine. You might have to go in the hospital for that, but that's a completely treatable disease. In 1920, they didn't have antibiotics for it, and often... Such an illness proved fatal, and such turned out to be the case with George Gipp. And so George Gipp, as the season was coming to a close, wasn't with his team. He was in the hospital, and Newt Rockney went to visit his star player in the hospital, realizing that George probably only, only had just a few days to live. And as Newt Rockney stood there beside George Gipp's bedside, George Gipp made this now famous quote. He said, Rock i got to go. It's all right. I'm not afraid. Sometime, the Rock, sometime in the future, when the team, the football team, is up against it, and things are wrong, and the brakes just aren't going our way, Rock, would you ask the team to give it all they've got and win one for the Gipper? 
You maybe have heard that phrase before. There was a movie made from it, and Ronald Reagan was George Gipp, and he's the one who, who made that famous phrase. Well, well, Newt Rockney took what George Gipp said and put it in his pocket, I'm sure planning to use it at some point. Eight years later, Notre Dame was having a difficult season. They weren't the powerhouse that they had been before. Their record was 4-4, four and four, and they were about to go up against one of the strongest teams in the country, an Army team that was undefeated on that day. No one gave Notre Dame any chance of beating Army. And Newt Rockney gathered his team together and made what is now considered one of the most famous football speeches and rallied his troops and said, let's win one for the Gipper. And he told the story of George Gipp. And Notre Dame raced out of that locker room and they beat Army 12 to 6 on that day. And they won one for the Gipper. I say that because a leader's words can be incredibly inspiring. The passage that Carla read just a few moments ago contains Jesus' final recorded words. What would be the last thing that Jesus would say to his disciples before he ascended up into heaven? Would, would he just talk off the cuff? <laughs> But he just say a couple of things that, that, that just came to his mind in the moment? Or would he say something profoundly significant? Profoundly significant not only for the disciples who were gathered there with him on that mountainside, would he say something profoundly significant for each and every one of us? Now I submit to you this morning that as the promised Messiah, as the Savior of the world, as the one who had fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophets, as the one who was experiencing that moment with his disciples, a moment that was planned in the sovereign and the foreknowledge of God, Jesus had something significant to say to his disciples. Something so significant that it transcends time, and it not only motivated them, but I trust that it motivates us as well. I'm not going to read the entire passage again, but I do want to read verse 8 once again, a very familiar verse. Some of you probably have memorized this verse. But Jesus said this, he said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Today's the, the final sermon in our unsinkable series. It's been a, a really cool series, and I'd remind you that not only are we preaching these messages, but 44 other churches throughout South Florida are preaching these exact messages. It's really cool. I was able last week, since I wasn't here, to get online and watch the sermons of several of our contemporaries as, as they preach this series. And by the way, I have to say that Jose and Brad are as good a preachers as anybody out there. And uh, I appreciate them so very much. But we've seen three truths already in this series. The first is this, that truth is not relative. It's not. We don't have the right to make up our own truth. Truth is absolute and is absolute truth truth is found in God's word as a matter of fact Jesus himself identifies himself as the truth he said I am the way the truth and the life nobody comes to God except through me you might sit back and say man Brian that's pretty countercultural I know it's pretty countercultural but that's the truth that's laid out in God's word. Brad, in the second week, talked about the fact that there is only one God, and it's not you, and it's not me. Even though it's easy for us to try to make ourselves the center of the universe and think that everything revolves around us, we are not God. There is only one God. He is sovereign. He is omnipotent. And the cool thing is that he desires to have a personal relationship with you and me. Last week, Jose talked about the gospel, the fact that the gospel is good news. It's not just good news, it's the best news. 
And if you've never truly understood the gospel, man, I hope today that, that, that you understand that Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, and then he gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins, and he rose again from the dead, just as he had prophesied. And when we believe in him, as we saw last week in John chapter 3, when we put our faith and our trust in him, our relationship with God is restored. And we become at that moment, or we begin to become, as God always intended for us to be, as we see clear back in Genesis chapter 1. Today we conclude our series here in Acts chapter 1, talking about our mission. So we've talked about truth, we've talked about God, we've talked about the gospel, and today we talk about mission. As most of you know, the book of Acts is the inspired history of the early church. It was written by Dr. Luke, Luke the Apostle. It relates for us a timeline of the spread of the gospel from the ascension of Jesus through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. If you've never read it, I certainly would encourage you to do so. As we mentioned a few moments ago, Jesus' last recorded words begin this exciting drama. So, uh, so the drama in the book of Acts begins not with what happens in Acts chapter 2 in Pentecost, but it actually begins with Jesus great, gathering that small group of disciples together and giving them one final uh, encouragement, one final challenge, one final command, as it were. Jesus, the coach, rallies his team together and challenges them to continue his mission, to reproduce themselves in the lives of others, and to go out and build his church and extend his kingdom, not just there in Jerusalem, but to extend his kingdom around the world. And I would submit to you today, as we'll see, that that command was not just given to those guys on a mountainside, but that command was given to each and every one of us here today. So just a couple of truths. If you have your outline in front of you, let me just give you a couple of truths that we kind of want to bring home today and, may, and then make a couple of points that I trust will be practical and, and penetrating and maybe even life-changing. The first is this. You are not alone. You are part of the church. Let me say that again. You are not alone. You are part of the church. The church. God never intended for Christians to live their lives alone. As a matter of fact, as you study the New Testament, there's no such thing as an isolated Christian. There's no such thing as a believer who says, no, I believe in Jesus Christ, but you know what? I think I can live this. I think I can do this. I think I can be this on my own. You weren't created to serve God alone. You weren't created to be that type of believer. You were created and redeemed to be a part of something. Let me show you a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27. Paul says this, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So, so, so Paul's not talking about corporately this This group of people that gather together every seven days that's called Hollywood Community Church. No, he's talking about you. He's talking about me. It's like he's speaking to us individually and he says, you are the body of Christ. And individually, you are members of it. The truth is seen in our Acts chapter 1 passage. In verse 8, Jesus looked at the disciples and he says this, you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you will be witnesses. It's interesting, the you in verse 8 is not singular. He's not just speaking to one person. He's not even just speaking to that small group of disciples. The you in Acts 1-8 is plural. And I would submit he's not just speaking to one disciple or to those disciples. He is speaking to all of us. 
We would say from a, from, from a theological point of view, this is an ecclesiastical point. He is speaking to you when he says you. He is speaking of his church. He is speaking of his body. And he looks at us, all of the corporate members of the church, and he says you, individually and corporately, you are my witnesses. And so as my witnesses, it is so important that you come together. Jesus is talking to his church, the organism to which you and I belong. I'm not sure whether you caught that word because we like to refer to the church as an organization. And I'm afraid in in this day and age, the church has become more of an organization. It's become more of a business than it is an organism. But the church is not an organization. The church is an organism. It is a living body made up of believers from all over the world. I think it's really cool, even as a family, we can sit back in in my son's church in Guatemala City. They are meeting right now. Guess what? Every single one of those believers are a part of the body of Christ, just as we're a part of the body of Christ. Mark's church up in Grafton, Wisconsin is about to meet and as those believers come together, every single one of them will be a part of the body of Christ. It's an organism. It is a living organism. It is a living body which continues to grow. The church though is not just Christ's body but the church is also his bride as well. He refers to it as his bride throughout the New Testament. His bride that he loves so very much. He loves his bride so much in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul says that he gave his very life for her. Ephesians 5.25 says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, we use Ephesians chapter 5 as a marriage passage, and it's a great, in all of our premarital counseling, we use Ephesians chapter 5 as a marriage passage, talking to husbands and wives. But as Paul concludes the passage, he really says, I'm not talking about marriages. He said, I'm speaking about Christ and the church. Because the church is Christ's bride. And as his bride, he has a deep love for his church. So so the question this morning is not, does Jesus love the church? The question, quite frankly, is this. How much do you love the church? Jesus loves the church. The question is, how much do we love the church? You can make it personal and say, or I can make it personal and say, how much do you love the church? It's easy for us to say we love something but we demonstrate our love in different ways. And I could illustrate that in a variety of ways this morning, and I won't take the time to do it. But obviously, one of the ways that we demonstrate our love for the church is our faithfulness to it. I was reminded this week, uh, some of you remember clear back in the, in the 70s when this place was filled every single week, Dr. Verl Ackerman was the pastor. Back then it was First Baptist Church of West Hollywood and Dr. Verl Ackerman was the pastor. And some of you remember they had a campaign at one point that they called Three to Thrive. Anybody remember that campaign? Couple, but boy, there's like two or three people that must have been here back then, all right? Three to thrive. The idea was this. It takes three to, to really thrive in your spiritual life. You need to go to church Sunday morning. You need to go to church Sunday night. And you need to go to church Wednesday night. They, listen, this is going to shock you. They actually had three services a week. And not only did they have three services a week, but they expected their people to attend all three services. And they had this campaign they called, It Takes Three to Thrive. And I think they had little buttons that they gave everybody. Three to Thrive. We want you to be here Sunday morning. We want you to be here Sunday night. We want you to be here Wednesday night. If you want to thrive in your Christian life, you need to gather together with God's people. And I read that and I thought, man, how times have changed. George Barna, who's doing actually a survey. We're going to help him with a survey on the churches in South Florida in in the coming months. You'll hear more about that in the coming weeks as we gather together with Church United. But George Barna has said that now faithfulness to church has changed so much. According to the most recent statistics, a person considers himself or herself faithful to church 
if they attend church twice a month. Not three times a week, not once a week. George Barna says that the most faithful people are attending church 24 to 30 times a year. That's all they're attending. I sat back and thought, man, we've changed. For it takes three to thrive to, I think with two I can survive, I think is what we've done. And here's what we've done, church, and I know I may be stepping on toes a little bit, but we have minimized the church. And we basically have sat back and said, you know what, I can do this on my own. I mean, mean, I've seen videos, you've seen videos. I don't need the church. I love Jesus, but I don't need the church. Listen, you can't love Jesus if you don't love his church. Why is that? Because he loved the church. He loved the church so much that he gave his life for it. Could you imagine coming up to me and saying, you know what, Brian, I really like you. I just don't like your wife very much. Now, now that never happens. I've had people say, I like your wife, but I don't like you. But I've never had anybody tell me that. But how would I respond to that? Would I look at that and say, you know what, I understand exactly what you're talking about. She gets on my nerves too. That's no problem at all. And so, Brian, we'd love to have you over. We want to get together with you. We just don't want to get together with your wife. Is that okay? How would I respond to that? I'd be offended by that. Listen, we're, we're one flesh. You get me, you get her. You get her, you get me. We're together. Jesus sits back and he says, listen, I love my church. And when you were saved, when you were redeemed, you were not only saved from sin and redeemed to be a believer, you were saved into something. You were saved out of something, but you were saved into something. And what you were saved into is the body of Christ. It's the church. We need to realize that church. We need to understand that, and we'll drive it home in just a few minutes at the end. But you are not alone. You are part of the church, which is Christ's body, which he gave himself for. The writer of Hebrews, looking down through time, warned us of this unfaithfulness. Because in Hebrews 10.25, the writer of Hebrews says, don't neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now can I tell you something? We need each other. We desperately need each other. We need to bond together. We need to be a part of something that is greater than us. And by God's grace, we are a part of something that is greater than us. It's called the church. And it's the church to which he has given his greatest mission. So the first point is this, you're not alone. You're a part of the church. Here's the second truth I want you to see today. You have been given a mission. You and I have been given a mission. Just as Newt Rockne motivated his team to give it all, so Jesus clearly articulated both his mission and his vision for the church. So, so, so I'll put two points in your, in your outline there. If you wanted, I, I wanted to have a whiteboard up here today, and we didn't get a whiteboard. So if I had a whiteboard, I would first of all write mission. And, and let me describe what the mission is. The mission is found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Also, one of the last things post-resurrection that Jesus said to his disciples. Here's the mission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So if I had a whiteboard up here, I would write mission, and here's our mission. Very simple, two words. Make disciples. That's our mission. Say that with me this morning. Make disciples disciples. That is what we have been commanded to do. We've kind of taken that and tweaked that just a little bit. And I think we've kind of missed what it is we've been called to do. Because we're not called to fill auditoriums. That's not what we've been commanded to do. 
We're not commanded to have really cool worship bands. It's not in Scripture. We're not instructed to have state-of-the-art facilities, fun children's programs, and Christian schools. Now, now don't get me wrong, all of those are great things. And we're trying our best to do all of those things with His power and to the best of our ability. But none of those things are our mission. We have been called to make disciples. That's what we've been called to do. As I mentioned, none of those things are bad. We want to fill our auditorium. I love our cool... Isn't Jonas cool? We have a... We have, We have a cool worship band. Maybe not as cool as you would like or maybe cooler than you would like. I'm not sure. Our children's program is really advancing under Chase's leadership. But listen to me today. All of those things are worth absolutely nothing if we are not making disciples. When we stand before God as leaders, he's not going to look at us and say, you know what, you had one of the coolest auditoriums that I think I've ever seen. He's not going to look at us and say, man, I just loved all the worship songs that you guys played. As a church, as a church, corporately and individually, we will give account for how we have fulfilled his final mission to us. His mission is this, go and make disciples. That's what we've been called to do. Not not just somebody who listens, Not just somebody who hears, but we are called to make disciples. And so because of that, he outlines different things. He said, man, help them take that step of baptism as a follower of Jesus Christ to identify as my follower. And then Jesus says, and teach them all the things that I have taught you so that they might grow in their faith. Jesus' command very simply is for us to reproduce ourselves. Here's what he's saying, as simple as can be said. Disciples make disciples. That's what he's saying. Disciples make disciples. Let me flesh that out so so it kind of resonates with us today. Parents, your most important responsibility as moms and dads is to reproduce discipleship in the lives of your kids. It's more important than making sure they get a quality education. It is more important to make sure that they play all the sports programs. It is more important than making sure they go to a good college. Your most important responsibility is to make sure that they're followers of Jesus Christ. Do you have friends? Your most important responsibility, your greatest act of friendship is to point them to Jesus. To make sure the people that you love and you hang around with also have a relationship with Jesus. That relationship that has changed your life. You want to make sure that they have it as well. Co-workers, that's your mission field. It's where God has placed you to, to live out, to live out realizing that God has placed you in that work so that you can do that work to the best of His or the best of your ability that He's given you and live out kingdom principles and enhance the kingdom of God so the people with whom you work see something different in your life. You see, just as Adam and Eve were commanded to multiply and fill the earth, By the way, that was God's original intent as he put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He created man in his image. And his goal was for image bearers, God image bearers, to fill the earth. His purpose has not changed. Just as he wanted Adam and Eve to multiply and fill the earth with image bearers, so we have been commanded to fill the earth with followers of Jesus Christ. That is our mission. So what's our, what's our mission? What is it? Okay, let me ask it again. So what is our mission? Make disciples. He talked about that. Our mission is to make disciples. Our vision, he gives us our vision here in the verse that we read in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And so the vision very simply is this. Take Jesus around the world. Take Jesus, take the message of the gospel around the world. Verse 8, we saw in Acts 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. 
We have, we, we've kind of transformed that just a little bit. And please, I, I don't want to seem sarcastic. I don't want to seem facetious. And so if I seem that way, please forgive me because I don't want to be that way. I'm just trying to be real. We've taken that almost to the fact of you shall be my witnesses so you can go to church a couple of times a month. And we've sat back and said, okay, as long as I'm doing that, I'm being who God wants me to be. That's not the mission. That's not the vision. And I'll say that pretty clear in just a few moments. We have been called for the purpose of being witnesses. It's really interesting. The word that's used for witness there is the same word that's translated martyr in other places in the New Testament. In other words, we, we would not do any injustice to the passage at all if we simply said, and the Holy Spirit has come upon you so that you will be my martyrs beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and around the world. Now, try to preach that message. How popular would that message be today? wouldn't be popular in the United States. Could you imagine, though, coming to Christ in another country around the world where becoming a follower of Jesus Christ already puts you against the law, already puts you against government authorities, and you realize that when you become a follower of Jesus Christ and you identify yourself as a Christian in believer's baptism, that at that moment you put yourself in a situation that you are in danger. You say, Brian, that would never happen. It's happening all over the world today. And by the way, guess where the church is growing the fastest? It's not in the United States where we have complete freedom to worship together. It's growing the fastest in what we call restricted access nations, where it's against the law to be a Christian where believers have to meet at one o'clock in the morning and slither together and meet, no lights on. They sing their worship songs in a whisper, and at the end of the service, they leave one by one not to attract attention to themselves. That's where the church is growing the fastest. And they understand that they have been called not just to be a witness, one who testifies for Jesus, the one who possibly will give his or her life for Jesus. Jesus says this, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And then he says, you'll be my witnesses beginning in Jerusalem, and then all Judea, and then Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Here's what Jesus does. He clarifies the extent of the mission. Jesus says, here's what I want. I want my disciples to carry the gospel beginning at Jerusalem and then carrying it to the ends of the earth. It's really interesting. We don't have time to talk about it today, but read early church history because the disciples took this command so literally that the disciples themselves spread out throughout the then known world sharing the gospel and the majority of them ended up giving their lives. They ended up being not just witnesses for the gospel, they ended up being martyrs for the gospel as well. Why is that? Because they believed the very words of Jesus. Jesus says, here's, here's your mission, make disciples. Here's the vision. Start at home and extend that around the world. Obviously, our job is not to begin at Jerusalem, so... You know, I'm not going to propose to you today, okay, we're, we're taking a group of people to Jerusalem next week to evangelize who's going. I'd probably have more people to do that than I would to do a prayer walk around, around our city. But the challenge for us is to what? To begin where we are. Our, our Jerusalem is the city of Hollywood. The, this is where we are supposed to begin. But it shouldn't stop here. That's what Jesus is saying, that our vision should be both local and it also should be global. So, some Bible teachers have combined those words and said that our vision should be global. <laughs> it should be global and at the exact same time, local. On a semi-frequent basis, I've asked, I'm asked by people in our congregation, Brian, why is it that we send so much money 
to missionaries around the world. Wouldn't we be better served to put new carpet in our building? Wouldn't we be better served to maybe do some things better around here? And yet, examining it from our perspective, we probably would. But we wouldn't be faithful in what God has called us to do. It was Jesus himself who said, your witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Our job is to make disciples. Disciples making disciples. So, so can I ask you today, how are you doing in fulfilling your mission? You might sit back and say, well, Brian, I think, I think that's the job of the pastors. That's why we pay pastors, so that they can make disciples. And I get that, all right? This, I mean, we're at this full time, but the command is for each and every one of us. You have spheres of influence that I don't have. You know people that I don't know. You rub shoulders with people that I will never, ever meet. You are Christ's representative in that place. And God has placed you there, wherever it is, for the purpose of enhancing his kingdom and making disciples. So our mission is make disciples. Our vision to the ends of the earth. It's easy for us to quantify that. It's easy for us to judge how are we doing both corporately and individually. Let me give you a couple of applications and I'm done today and we're going to take the Lord's Supper. The first application is this. The church is not something you attend. It's something you are. The church is not something that you attend. It's something you are. You just don't attend church on Sunday. You are the church on Monday. You are the church on Tuesday. You are the church on Wednesday. When we walk out of these doors, it's not like, okay, boy, I was at church, now I'm going back to the rest of my life. The church is not a building. You are the church. We are the church who meets in a building. This building could come, this building could go, but the church of Jesus Christ will continue to exist. When Jesus said, when Jesus made the statement, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he's not saying, and none of the buildings we build in the future will ever fall down. That's not what he's saying. As a matter of fact, the New Testament church didn't even have buildings. There's no recorded history of churches having buildings until two or three hundred years later. The church was growing. It was an organism. It was vibrant. It was making disciples. It was reproducing itself long before they had buildings and air conditioning and comfortable seats and screens and bands. They were what? They were doing what Jesus called them to do. Disciples making disciples. The church, not just Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday through the rest of the week. Would you say it with me this morning? I am the church. Would you say it with me? I am the church. Say it like you believe it. I am the church. Turn to the person beside you and say, you are the church. We will never change Hollywood by just attending church. We won't. If all we are is attenders of Hollywood Community Church, we will never make an impact on the city. We will never make an impact on our world. You don't don't change the world by going to church. We will only change the world by being the church. When we walk out of these doors today realizing I am the church. I represent Jesus Christ. I am a living representative of Jesus Christ. And my job, my responsibility is to represent Him everywhere I am. When we, when we take that to heart, that's when we're going to make a difference 
in our community, when we transform from being church attenders to being the church day after day and week after week. Church is not something you attend. It's something you are. Let me say a second thing. You are not deep if you're not actively involved in making disciples. You are not deep if you're not actively involved in making disciples. We've used the iceberg analogy this, this whole series. And as pastors, we've got together and we've talked through this iceberg analogy every way you can imagine. But, but Brad alluded to several weeks ago, and it's true, that the biggest part of the iceberg is not above the water. Remember the picture I showed you of the, the iceberg that supposedly brought down the Titanic? It didn't look that big. You sit back and think, how could that small iceberg bring down such a large ship? Well, the reason is up to 90% of the iceberg is found under the water. The, those icebergs are able to survive. Why? Because they have depth. And it's the depth of the iceberg that allows it to survive the crashes of life. And our whole challenge for us during this series is it's the depth that we are going to have that's going to allow us to survive the struggles and the tragedies of life. You're not deep if you're not involved in making disciples. You might be able to quote all 66 books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, you can go from Genesis all the way to Revelation. You, you might have a lot of the Bible studied, and you might be a great Bible knowledge person, maybe more than anyone else. But if you're not involved in making disciples, you're not deep. You're shallow. Why is that? Because what Jesus our commander-in-chief called us to do was to make disciples. Now, quite frankly, we can do that in a lot of different ways. The, uh, the only way is not to walk out of here and say, okay, I've got to go talk to every person I know today about Jesus. That's one way to do that, but there's a lot of ways that we can do that, living out the truth of the gospel. The simple question is this, is your life reproducing itself? That's the challenge. Real depth is demonstrated by disciples making disciples. You might sit back and say, Brian, I'm scared to do that. I'm scared to go to work and identify as a Christian. I'm scared to death to, to during break, to reach out to my coworker and, and ask them if they're a follower. Of, Man, Brian, I, I, I don't even know how to do that. I'm scared to death. To, I'm scared to walk across the street and invite my neighbors to church. It terrifies me. Man, I get that. But shouldn't there be some level of fear in our mission? Think about that, church. Shouldn't there be some level of fear? If there was no level of fear, we could do it in our own power. We could depend upon our own abilities. We could depend upon our own talents. But Jesus doesn't look at us and say, suck it up. Use every ability that you have and go out there and reach people for Christ. That's not what he said. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit of God has come upon you. And with his power and with his enablement, you will be my witnesses. It doesn't depend upon who you are. It doesn't depend upon how much you know. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a pa pa pastor. You have the same Holy Spirit living within you that I have. And he's empowered you to be a witness. The last point is this. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit who empowers you to be a witness. I love this verse in Mark. He's talking about the last days. And I don't want to uh, take it out of context, but Jesus said this. He's talking about you giving an answer for who you are. He says, and when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, don't, don't be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but you say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit who speaks through you. So we began the series talking about the Titanic. Let me end talking about the Titanic. There was a passenger on the Titanic by the name of John Harper. John Harper was a Scottish pastor. He was a Scottish evangelist. He, he was known for his passion for souls. They say that John Harper would prostrate himself before God in prayer and say, God, give me souls or, 
or, or, or help me to die. I want to reach people for Christ. He was so passionate about reaching people for Christ that he became world-renowned. So much so that Moody Bible Institute in Chicago heard about him and wanted John Harper to travel from, uh, from, the, from, uh, from England, from Scotland, and come over and challenge their students. So John Harper did that. He grabbed his wife and his six-year-old daughter, and they boarded the Titanic heading for the United States to challenge students in Chicago for Jesus Christ. You know the story. The Titanic hit the iceberg and started to go down. They say that John Harper stood on the back of the ship and began directing people to lifeboats, saying, all the women, all the children, and all the unsaved, come and take these lifeboats. You see, he, one by one, began going to people, asking them, are you saved? Do you know Jesus? And one by one, sharing the gospel, they're on the Titanic, leading people to Christ. John Harper went down in the water, and they say that in the water, with a life preserver on, he swam from person to person, saying, are you saved? Do you know Jesus? Leading many people to Christ, there in the water. They say that he swam up to one man and asked him, do you know Jesus? Do you want to be saved? And the man said no. And John Harper tried his best. This man was floating on a log. And John Harper tried his best to convince him to give his life to Christ. And the man insisted. And John Harper began to swim away and turned around, took off his own life jacket and threw it at the man and says, you need this more than I do. John Harper swam away to his own death, the hypothermia caused him not long after to sink. That man who took the life preserver was rescued, one of the few people that was rescued. And because of John Harper's testimony, gave his life to Jesus. And four years later, as they brought together all of the survivors, that man stood up in front of everybody and said this, I am John Harper's last Isn't that powerful? That's a story you never hear when you, when you hear the story of the Titanic. True story. You say, how do you know, Brian? Google it. You'll see. It's on, it's on Google. You can see it. Huh? I'm being facetious. It's a true story. John Harper knew what his mission was. Until his very last breath, he was committed to fulfill church, you're not alone. You're a part of the church. You have been given a mission, and that mission is not just to attend church. That mission is to make disciples and to grow and take the gospel around the world. That's what we have been called to do. You say, okay, Brian, how can I do that? Let me give you a real practical action point today. On your outline, I simply have this. List the names of five people that you would like to invite to our Christmas services here at Hollywood Community Church. Would you just take just a few, just a simple way to begin. And just, you can do it right now or you can do it later. Just begin to think, okay, God, who is it that I can invite? I might be terrified to do so, but who is it that I can invite? And write their names down and begin praying for them. And begin asking God to give you an opportunity to invite them. Or maybe share your testimony. Or maybe tell them about Jesus. Disciples make disciples. That's what we've been called to do. Would you stand with me today as our praise team comes? Hey, and... And church, can I tell you, I'm so convicted about this. I, I know my job is to, to lead and my job is to preach and to do all of that, but, but I'm as called to be a, a witness as you are. And sometimes I don't do a very good job. And sometimes I'm scared just like you are and I'm terrified. But what would happen if we took this command to heart? There's no limit how God could use us. 
are going to lead us in, in a hymn. And I'm going to ask you to prepare your heart in just a few moments. Not yet. Our leaders are going to come down, and we're going to end the service taking the Lord's Supper. First of all, if you're here today, and there's never been a time that you have trusted Jesus Christ. You know for sure that you're saved. You know your sins are forgiven. You know you're a child of God. I would encourage you in your heart to do it. We have leaders that would love to show you how you can make that decision. Maybe you're sitting back saying, man, God, help me to be involved in this mission. Could we just wait? Let's just wait yet. I want to have a response moment then. Okay, so, so, so you respond how, however God responds or God asks you to respond. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Help us to take these words not as if Brian is saying them today, but help them to take them as they are, the very words of Jesus. Help us to be sensitive right now to the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.